I know uh, I want to get into this, this word today. My heart is stirred, amen? You see what's going on in the world and, you know, in the news this morning, just three hours ago, things changed again when Putin's making a little more aggressive with his threat. He said when he was going in to invade uh, the Ukraine, he said if any outside forces, you know, try to stop us or hinder what we're planning, and you'll see destruction as never before in human history, which we know what he's talking about there. And then this morning early, he said um, he put his nuclear arsenal team on high alert. So, folks, this is uh, this, that's serious. We haven't seen a nuclear bomb go off since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we know the destruction that that caused. Praise the Lord, it ended up working out. It might have, uh, at that time, might have saved lives by ending World War II, just like that. But uh, those type of weapons have been increased from that time till now. And there's a few nations on the earth that have them, and unfortunately, Russia is one of them. So when he puts in, it looks like, um, it looks like, and uh, his war in Ukraine not going the way he wanted. Praise the Lord for uh, the president there. Instead of uh, taking the out that President Biden offered him, a ride out of there, he said, no, I don't want a ride. I need weapons and help. And he stayed on and rallied his people, and they're fighting in the streets. As I know, praise God, if we were invaded right here in Winsboro or in the United States, we would also. And uh, they're fighting in the streets, and they're delaying that takeover of, of Kiev. And, um, you know, the, the United States, along with many other nations, have um, upped our game in and, um, and the sanctions and finally agreeing together to put a halt on their SWIFT account. And that SWIFT account is how all the transactions work across the banking industry all over the world. Sometimes when I'm sending money to Africa, I, I call our banker, praise God, who goes to the church with us, and we're able to get, a, um, I need a SWIFT code from the other bank to make that happen. Well, without that happen, it puts, puts a lot more teeth in there. Um, we've got senators right now trying to encourage um, the United States to move forward in drilling again so we won't have to be relying. And it's crazy that they're going to war and we're still buying foreign uh, Russian oil. That doesn't need to happen. So anyway, there's a lot changing. But praise God, our word tells us, and, and that's why it, I just believe it was prophetic that God led us to study the Psalms over January, February. And we see in David writing the Psalms, so many of the Psalms was about the battle of, of him being surrounded and all kind of starting crying out for justice and crying out for righteousness and then seeing, you know, ultimately saying, but Lord, I'm going to trust in you. Amen. No matter what happens, no matter what it looks like in the world, hey, we're, you are our refuge, you are our strength, and we're going to trust in you. So I've got a, I've got a, a word today for you. We're going to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine here at the end, but let's open up where we left off yesterday. Open up Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to point out a few more specific things here. Psalm 2. And we focused here, Why do nations conspire and peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. You know, at that point, I was reading last week, and I, I made a statement. I said, God's not afraid of Putin. And there was a little five-year-old boy over here <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with Terry and Charlotte Poland's grandson. And he was sitting on the ground with his back to us, and he was coloring, but he was listening. And he heard the pastor say, the Lord's not afraid of Putin. <laughs> and he started giggling. And he kept on giggling. And finally, 
His grandma Charlotte said, what is it? What's wrong? And he said, your preacher said the Lord's not afraid of Putin. <laughs> and he started laughing all louder. And she tried to tell him that's a man's name. He said, no, it isn't. <laughs> anyway, so that was kind of funny. I told my wife and others, and then they told me that they were, oh, Charlotte's right there. I'm not embarrassing you anyway. It was, but they uh, were on their way to school, and they were praying, and, and the boy prayed again. And, and I pray for that preacher who said God's not afraid of Putin. So he was still thinking, uh, so I mean, you never know. Some uh, kids are listening, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So God is on the throne and he says, you know, he laughs and scoffs at them. The rulers of the world try to make their own plots and own plans without God. They try to do their own thing their way. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I'm just resolving that. We have a king who is the king of kings. We belong to a nation, a kingdom that will never end. Nations are going to rise and fall. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. But you be of good cheer and stand firm knowing, praise God, you belong to a kingdom that's never going to fall. And our king will never fall. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. I like the way the Psalms, there's so much in it that was written, you know, in David's time, a thousand years before Christ. And then a lot of the quotes from the Psalms we see in the New Testament written when it happened. Amen? And we know the heavens opened when Jesus was baptized and God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know, prophet, the, that prophetic utterance of the Psalms comes to pass there. He says, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. Verse 8 Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. Now I want to go John chapter 17, one of my favorite books of the Bible there, favorite chapters as Jesus is praying for, you know, for us. He's praying. He says, Lord, I'm not just praying for these guys right here, my disciples alone, but I'm praying for those who will believe on the word they're preaching. That's you and I. And he says, I pray for all of those you've given me. Out of all the nations, God has given Jesus, hallelujah, the King of kings and Lord of lords who died for the sins of the world, and He proclaimed this gospel of the kingdom shall go out, and people from all the nations are coming to know Christ everywhere, in Ukraine, and in Russia, in China, and all over the nations, hallelujah. We have brothers and sisters, and, and He said, ask of Me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and we know John 17, Jesus is praying, of all that you've given me, I'm lost none, except that one that was doomed for perdition, that one that, of Judas. He said, but of all you've given me, I've lost none. I want you to know, praise the Lord. I, I praise the Lord that this prophetic utterance in the Psalms is, is happening now too, as people from nations all over the world are being saved, healed, delivered, and coming to know Christ. You will rule them, verse 9, Psalm 2, verse 9, you will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Go with me now. They'll put it on the screen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Revelation 12, 5. It also talks about in Genesis 49, 10, it talks about he's coming from the tribe of Judah, the, from the tribe of Judah, the line of Judah, uh, the, the scepter will have no end. They'll always be the ruler. Talked about Jesus coming from the tribe of Judah. And then in Revelation 12, 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. A lot of times there's a theme written in Genesis that continues in the Psalms, that continues in Revelation. And we can understand that. You know what a, that scepter is? You know, you see a, a king holding a scepter. It's his ruling staff. With an iron scepter, he will rule our strong and mighty king of all. Praise the Lord. 
And then it goes on, and we mention this, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Be warned! Governments that reject God and reject Christ and reject truth and want to go their own way, in the name of Jesus, by the Word of God, be warned! You know, every Tuesday morning, Wes comes in and he, he cuts out all of the, uh, the, the worship part that everybody got to watch on live stream and the announcements and stuff and brings the message down and reposts that. So that's what we send to different places. It gets on television in Pakistan, pastors in Africa watching it. And he reduces it down and then I send it to you. You know, we put it on our River of Life Facebook page, the big one that you can share. Then we put it on the River of Life family page. Then I usually put it on my page and I want to encourage you something. Man, it's an easy thing to, uh, to witness these days. You're home having lunch with your family. You click on that and you, send, you share it yourself. And all the people that you have influence over that watch your page can say, hey, here's something my pastor taught this week and it's relative to what happened in Ukraine. And you can send it to them. We made a shortened version, like 20 minutes, that talked about it, showed the map and the history. So you can let people know. You can click it and copy it and send it personally and, and message it to one of your family members or your friends. So praise God, we want to do personal witnessing, knocking on their door and laying hands on them and praying for them. But praise God, you can also send the word your pastor spoke as unction by the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we can share that word. So I encourage you to do that. So we took this one and we shortened it down. A lot of you talked about you enjoyed that history lesson and understanding about what happened after World War II and why it's going on. So we shared that and we reduced it down and we shared it again. And then I put a little something on there. I wrote with it, Putin be warned. I put that in there. Well, Zuckerberg and the metaverse didn't like that, so they didn't boost it for me. I was going to send it to Moscow and other places. I believe we got a word for the, for the people. We got a word for the people all over the world. But because I wrote that, they wouldn't send it. You know? You know, you, you, you can criticize Trump and get on Facebook, but you can't criticize Putin, huh? Isn't that something? Interesting. So it's kind of like in, in Russia, on their media, they only send out the propaganda of how they view the war. And their media has to line up with the president or they could be taken in, you know, lose their job, killed, whatever. We don't want that to start happening in our country where we don't have freedom of the press. Amen. We want to be able to get truth out. So anyway, I didn't like that, what they did. So I sent another message out in a veiled reference. Maybe y'all have that picture of that, I don't know, if uh, that picture of the verse with the, the crown of thorns. You know? And I sent this one out, and people were, uh, cut these house lights down low a little bit, so everybody, maybe you saw it on our Facebook page. So I didn't say nothing, but quoted the Word of God. And the Bible says in John 11.50, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Now Jesus didn't say this in John. Caiaphas did. And when Caiaphas said this, he was talking about killing Jesus. But then the Bible says later that Caiaphas as high priest that year he had the position and the authority to prophesy to the nation. Even though he wasn't a godly man following the Holy Spirit, he was bound under the law and he hated and was coming against Jesus, he still had the authority as a position given by God to prophesy to the nation of Israel. And he wrote this. You do not realize he's trying to make a point at the trial that it's, hey, it's better rather than cause all this problem, it's better that we go ahead and execute this Jesus. It's better for one man to die than all to perish. But he didn't realize he was prophesying under the Holy Spirit because what he said came true. It is better for that one man, Jesus, to die than the whole world perish. That's what he really meant, but he didn't know it. 
He thought he was getting rid of Jesus to get him out of the way so Israel can go back to being under the law and they can have control again and people wouldn't follow Christ anymore. But man, he was prophesying truth and didn't realize it. The Bible says, I wrote it in a different way. And some of y'all can understand that. I might not say it on live broadcast here, you know? But, you know, wouldn't it have been something if for some folks recognized by the Spirit what's happening in 1939 and would have stopped Hitler in his tracks right then before he killed six million Jews? You know? Wouldn't it be better for some people that have been you know, in, in, in history of the Soviet Empire, if you watch the movie Stalin and see, you'll see that Stalin had a reputation of, of having all of his leaders would be like yes men. And when he'd have a big meeting, if anybody disagreed with them, they might be taken out and executed right there at the meeting. And Putin runs the same way. So maybe some of these folks have been realizing what he was doing was not the right thing to do. Maybe they were realizing, you know, they should talk to him, but maybe they're afraid to tell him. Well, man, which is better to stand up and, and speak what's right and do the right thing or to send thousands of your kids into a war they know nothing about? And now they're dying on the front lines with Ukrainian boys and fighting in, in that instead of for some, 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 you know, psychopathic leader who's pushing them out there. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. So David cries out in this way all through the Psalms. You can turn, cut the lights back up. David cries out. He sees Saul coming against him, and he sees all of these things happen, and he cries out to God to, to you know, fight his enemies. just want to put this in perspective today. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. I'm glad I'm seeing different posts from different ones. I saw Miss Judy Johnson from our church here post the Ukrainians in a place together, Christians singing in a bomb shelter or in a subway where they're hiding out and they were just singing praises to the Lord is beautiful. We got brothers and sisters united with Christ and united with you in Russia and in Ukraine and all over Europe. The gospel's been going out for 2,000 years. Our brothers and sisters, we want to pray for them today. Hallelujah. Psalm 27 Let's flip there now. Psalm 27, I'm just going to read a few verses here. And as I read it, let's read it as a prayer for the people of Ukraine right now, of those Christians there. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me and devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His tabernacle and set my feet high upon the rock. Then my head will be exalted above my, the enemies that surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. It didn't matter if David was surrounded. It didn't matter if trouble's on all sides. He decided the Lord is my refuge, my strength, and I'm going to praise him. Church, we know that no matter what shakes, no matter what happens, ultimately, praise God, the saints win, right? So we can stand on that, we can trust on that, we can pray that, we can teach our children and our children's children. But I like what it says here again. There's a lot of specific things that's veiled in the Psalms that comes to pass in the New Testament. And here's just one that's kind of uh, seen here, Psalm 27. 
Two, when evil men advance against me and devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. I like this. Uh, I like the way this played out in John 18. Go with me to John 18. If y'all have that, guys, put that on the screen so I can read it off of there. John 18, 1 through 6. Y'all remember this? I've always liked this verse. Jesus is praying in the garden. They came to arrest him. They surrounded him. His enemies surrounded him. When they had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus has often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. You know, Caiaphas has already said it's better for one man to die than the whole nation. Y'all go arrest him. We're going to bring him in and we're going to try him. So they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, Jesus knew all that was going to happen already, and he knows what's going to happen in Ukraine and in Russia and in the U.S. He knows. Hallelujah. He went out and asked them. So he didn't wait for them to come on in, and he didn't hide behind a tree. He walked up to them and said, who is it you want? He walked right up to them, straight, face to face. And John 18, 6 says this, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, he said, and Judas the traitor was standing with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I like that. That's pretty cool. Amen. Jesus is in the garden praying with his disciples. They're falling asleep. He's in agony praying, knowing what's coming but he's going to choose us to do it anyway. And here they come. He walks straight out to meet them head on and said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And when he said it, you know what happened? They fell out. <laughs> they fell down. One version, one, one of the gospels says like dead men. They passed out. They fainted. They fell out. Slain in the spirit, whatever you want to call it. They fell out. Jesus said, I am he. And the power of who he was knocked them all out. You know, next verse, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Go another one. Again, they asked him. Again, he asked. So, so now they're getting up a little slowly. They're getting up, and now they're looking, and they're looking at each other. What just happened? And he says, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these others go. So now I imagine they're a little more timid this time. When he says, who is it you want? He's, uh, 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 Jesus of Nazareth. You know, we were sent by them. It's not our, we didn't decide to do this. We were sent by them. You know, that's happening to some of those Russian soldiers in the streets when the Ukrainian men are standing in front of the tank and talking to them and some mothers yelling at them, why are you here? What are you doing? I don't know. I joined the army in Russia and this is what they, they sent me here. I'm not, I'm not sure where I am. I heard some of them stopped and asked for directions. You know, and they're being confronted. Praise the Lord. The power of God, Jesus. So here's was written in the Psalms and it was fulfilled again in the New Testament. But I want to take you to the message today in Psalm 69. Go with me. If y'all would open your Bibles, turn there and we'll follow along here a little ways. Psalm 69, verse 4. And we're going to quote some of these verses in this psalm that it's also fulfilled in the New Testament. But I have a point to make. And I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak. Psalm 69, verse 4. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me. So we see that, and in the New Testament, we see that they, Jesus was attacked, hated, cursed at, without cause, without reason. He did nobody no harm, any harm. He also said, if they hated me, then they're going to hate you, my followers. 
I remind you of that from time to time. Because if the world loves you, something's wrong with your walk, church. The Bible says the world's going to hate you if you follow Christ. If the world around lots of folks who don't know Christ, who aren't following Christ, who are living like the world, if they love you, you need to examine yourself. Because this walk we walk, it shines light in a darkness. And it'll shine light, praise the Lord. And folks who are struggling, who seek in the light, will talk to you. But folks who want to keep their stuff in darkness will get away from you and hate you. And they don't want it exposed. So we're not greater than Him. If they hated Christ, they're going to hate If you're walking with Christ, the world's going to hate you. Because you're not of this world. Okay? So if you're friends of the world, the Bible says something's wrong. Amen? We're not a friend of the world. We love the world like Christ loved the world. Because we want to bring the world out of the darkness and into the kingdom, the light of the kingdom. Amen? But you do not belong to this world, church. You belong to the kingdom of God. And we're here passing through to take some others with us. Psalm 69, verse 7. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. The Bible says in John 7, 1 through 7, that Jesus is with his brothers, and they were saying, Hey, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and show yourself? You're doing these miracles. Why don't you show yourself to everyone? For the Passover was coming and Jesus was going to go. And then it says, because even his brothers did not believe in him. Imagine that. You're going to face, when you're walking with Christ and you come to know this Christ and you follow him, like we want, we follow him and you're starting to live for him, now you'll go back home down south and start to, uh, your life will be changed and some of your family members will ask you, hey, you know, we wanted you to get off drugs, but you don't take this religion too far. You know, you don't, don't bring all that stuff. We don't want to hear about that. What you going to do, man? You persecuted by your own family. Well, we know you're going up there and listening to that Pastor Dave at that non-denominational church. Well, when you get back here, we want you to go to, you know, Grandma's Catholic Church. Or we want you to do this, or we want you to do that. Or come on, listen, hey, don't take that religion too far, you know. We don't care if you, we, we go together with you on Easter and, you know, and, and go ahead of Lent and, and, and do Palm Sunday and do those things. But man, don't, don't start reading the Bible and talking to us about Christ and praying. Don't go that far. Even his own brothers. Well, praise God, guys, if you follow the word through there, his brothers came to know him later. Amen. His brother James became one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church, so it's a good thing. But here I'm just showing you the prophecy a thousand years before in Psalm 69 came to pass and it was spoken of again in the New Testament. So God knows. And then praise God, look at verse 20. Psalm 69, 20, scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I look for sympathy, but there was none for comforters, but I found none. The Bible says after they arrested him, There in the garden, his disciples ran off. Peter followed from a distance, and he was watching the trial, and so watching them take him in. But when they said, hey, aren't you one of them? He denied Christ three times. So, you know, here, this this psalm was was answered. There was no comforters around him. The only one at the foot of the cross was John. Why? Because John had the revelation that he knew Christ loved him. Peter had the revelation, I better do good for God. I better do good. And when he didn't do good, he fell off. John had the revelation, I'm the one that Christ loved. And he was the one standing at the cross with Mary. The only one. You see? See, this thing about Christ, what we preach, is not about how much you have to try to be more religious and try to do good. It's about you receiving and knowing how much Christ loves you. That's what will make the difference. Hallelujah. But I want to focus today's message on Psalm 69, verse 9. The Bible says, For the zeal of your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you insult you fall on me. Everybody say zeal. 
The zeal of your house consumes me. We know this came to pass when Jesus came into the temple. And when He came to the temple, praise God, He saw all around the temple they were buying and selling and there was money changers and all going on. And they were trying to you know, get their unspotted lamb uh, registered and, and right for the sacrifice. And the priest would say, your lamb's not good enough and sell you another one. And it was a racket. And Jesus came in there and he looked at the temple, the house of God. Hallelujah. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. And he made it. He took the time to grab some leather and make a whip. And then by himself, without rounding up his disciples and giving them all whips, without rounding up a team to say, hey, come follow me in this, Jesus by himself took the whip and started turning over money tables and started whipping them and drove them out by himself. That's my hero, man. What was that? And then the disciples remembered. The Holy Spirit brought it to them and they wrote it down. They remembered this psalm in 69, the zeal of my house consumes me. Do you know the zeal of God and Christ for this house of God consumes Him? You are the temple and the zeal of this house, you, consumes Christ. And He's zealous for you. A zeal, a passion, For you, that would drive out anything that would harm you, that would protect you, that would watch over you, that'll come to your rescue, that'll die for you. The zeal of the house consumes him. And he wants this house to be a house of prayer. A house that's willing to be insulted by the world like he was. Praise the Lord. He was stirred up. Go with me to Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 11. Romans 12, verse 11. The Bible says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. Tell you what, when things happen in the world, and I see it on the news, and read about it in the prophecy and see things happen, my zeal gets stirred up. How about you? I don't want to run and hide. I want to jump and shout. I want to run to the roar. I want to talk about the Lord more, not less. I want to gather in the house of the Lord more. I don't want to run and hide. When there's a play going around, something going around, I want to run to the house of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord is stirred up in me right now. I know it is in you as well. The Bible says in Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal. If you've been lacking in zeal, I hope today you'll be stirred up and your zeal will be filled. Your passion. What is zeal? Hallelujah. That word, zeal, a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. President Zelensky said, no, President Biden, I don't want to ride out. I want weapons. And he had a zeal for his homeland. Now, I know in the past, let me tell you something. We got Christian saints over there we're praying for, and they love the Lord, and they're righteous and holy. But, you know, also, just to balance it out, that nation has been corrupt for years. Okay? Ukraine also. But they had like sometimes puppet governments of Russia and they were corrupt with him. But praise God, the people are crying out for freedom and that's what they should have. Freedom, not an opposing, they're crying out. They got zeal as we would if there was tanks from China rolling into our cities. There would be a zeal and a passion for a purpose to stay free, amen? Never be lacking in zeal. A passion and an, an excitement a, 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 for, for a cause to be stirred up, a great energy or enthusiasm in p- pursuit of a cause or an objective, an eager partnership, a fervency, passionate, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Doesn't say a prayer of somebody just saying a few words they memorized 
without any passion, without any fervor, doesn't say that avails anything. A prayer without faith where you're just going through the motions and think you should pray, so you say a few words and it doesn't mean anything and you're not passionate and you're not fervent. It doesn't say that avails much, but the Bible says an effectual, fervent, zealous prayer avails much because you're mixing the faith with your words and you're praying that kingdom come, thy will be done, his will. You're praying with fervency. There's a difference. Hallelujah. Zeal. Now one of the 12, here's where I want to go. We're going to learn something here. One of the 12 disciples Jesus chose was named Simon the Zealot. He was a zealot. Now zealot had taken the word zeal and mixed it with a passion Let's look at the purpose, and let's see. Believe, praise God, some of us would say in the midst of a battle like that, we're probably right at the time. But maybe their purpose got misdirected, I don't know. Simon the Zealot, one of the twelve. Who were the Zealots? Well, the Zealots at the time of Christ was a political movement of the Judean Jews, those from Judah down by Jerusalem, that whole area. It was a political movement, but it was also a military movement. They sought to overthrow the occupying Roman government. Which, really, if we look at Ukraine and Russia, if we look at what would happen here today, I'm sure if we were being oppressed by another government like Russia, we would also be zealots wanting to overthrow them. Hello? I used to view this in a different light. But now when it's coming home and seeing, we can see. So some of those zealots, man, they vowed that only God, only the Lord God was their God and they would have no other. And Rome comes in and saying, you have to worship Caesar. And they say, I'd rather die than worship Caesar. And they started finding swords and and practicing and fighting. And they would take it into measure of maybe trying to take out or pick off one of the Roman leaders at the time, one by one, and see if they could start a movement. Hello? When we're thinking about it now in the terms of Ukraine and Russia, in the terms of if we were being invaded, we understand them a little better, don't we? And Jesus picked one of the zealots who is a member of that organization that had been trained in to fight, and he picked one of them as a disciple. Now get this, isn't it something? He also picked Matthew, Complete enemies, complete opposites. Matthew was working for Rome, collecting taxes from the Jews. All the Jews hated him now. And Rome, he was working for Rome. And Simon, the zealot, was working to overthrow Rome. So you have these natural enemies that Jesus chose, one from one side and one from the other, and would have made them both disciples. Isn't that something? And they came together in peace. We don't know all of how it happened because it only says he chose Simon the zealot and he lists him with the disciples, but it doesn't say much about it. I'm glad Dallas Jenkins took on the role of trying to elaborate that for us in the movie The Chosen. And you can see Simon the zealot and Matthew there and how it might have been. It's great. Praise the Lord. So the zealots, they, they, they vowed to forcefully remove Rome. Now, let's see what the Word says about this. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. And then we're going to look at Galatians and then Isaiah. Romans 10. When i got to move quickly. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that the Israelites, that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. You can be real zealous about a cause and your zeal not based on knowledge as Saul was. Watch this. Saul said he was more zealous for the cause of the law 
than any of them. He knew the law better than all of them. And he was zealous for Moses' law. And he was zealous against this new thing happening of Christians. You know, they, he thought they were moving away from the law and toward this guy named Jesus Christ. And he was so zealous about getting Israel back under the law that he persecuted the Christians and he went to arrest them. And he was zealous without the knowledge of the truth. So you can be zealous and you can be overzealous about some things, right? So there he was overzealous and he, till he came to know the truth. And then we know Paul was passionate and zealous about one thing, Jesus Christ. And he just left all the Old Testament, all the way that he was brought up in religion, he left that behind. And he said, for this one thing, Christ, I live now. And he, went, he didn't go around preaching his old religion. He preached Christ and nothing else. Everywhere he went. He was zealous for the main thing. He was now zealous with knowledge. Amen? Galatians 1, 13 and 14. Galatians. No, let's go to, we said that already. Go to Galatians 4, 17 and 18. Galatians chapter 4, 17 and 18. Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. Some are zealous for their religion or zealous for their cause. And the same Paul who wrote, you know, don't lack in zeal is also wrote, writing, don't have zeal for the wrong thing. Now I love this verse. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. It's a prophecy about Christ coming and Him being King. And He says, Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. But then He says this. Hallelujah. In verse, the next verse. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I'm so glad Apostle James Rebavaru came from India and stood at this pulpit one day two years ago and explain this verse. And he said, praise God, the increase of the government is peace. I want to re um, tell you that again, that praise God, I want you to know, no matter what it looks like, what uh, Putin rattling arms that could be nuclear, no matter what's happening, I'm telling you of the increase of Jesus Christ, government and peace on earth will be no end. It will continue to increase no matter what the kings of the earth are doing, no matter what happens, it's going to increase forever. And you know who's going to accomplish it? the zeal of the Lord. Our God is zealous to accomplish what He said. And the zeal of, he, is zeal, he is zealous and passionate for the purpose of advancing His kingdom around the earth. And His zeal is going to accomplish it. I want you to know you got the zeal of God on your side. Hallelujah. Give him, somebody give Him praise. You got God is passionate, the zeal of the Lord for His house, and you are His house, the zeal for His for you consumes Him, and He's going to advance His cause to the ends of the earth, and it's going to ever increase, and His zeal is going to accomplish it. Man, if I'm going to be zealous, I'm going to be zealous with the purpose of God. I'm going to be zealous for the same thing He's zealous of, of advancing His kingdom. Amen? We want to be zealous for what He says is the right purpose. Wow, to finish this story. Help me, Lord. So the zealots continued. Simon the zealot didn't. He turned and found the truth. Left behind what he was passionate about. And now he be became passionate about Christ. The rest of the zealots... I don't know how many, did not. They stayed passionate about overthrowing Rome. Even after Jesus said, you see these bricks? You see that temple? You see this city? I'm telling you, not one stone will be left on another. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. He, he walked the earth for 40 days after He rose. Simon the zealot saw Him and rejoiced that he had left his old purpose and saw his new purpose. The other zealots did not. They continued to fight Rome. In 66 AD, 
after Christ. A band of those zealots have gained enough steam and momentum for their purpose and cause that they fought Rome. And they stood up to Rome and they, with knives and spears and everything they had, and they made a rebellion because Rome had declared, you know, hey, you're going you're gonna to worship the, um, you're going to worship the God of Rome and they instilled in that kind of religion like a cult and those Jews weren't having it. We serve one God and one God only. But their one God came to them and they missed it. And they still had zeal and a passion for the wrong thing. And they stirred up to fight Rome. See, Jesus in His heart, praise God, Jesus in His has already defeated Rome. They just didn't see it yet. I'm telling you, all the nations of the earth and everything is already defeated and you're already on the winning side and we're going to stand and be strong and be zealous about Christ. So they stood and they fought. Well, here's the rest of the history. Gave us a history lesson last week. Here's the rest of this history. In 70 AD, Rome sent more legions in, and they crushed not only the zealots, they crushed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Yeah, those zealots stirred up a hornet's nest. And Rome came in and crushed them all and even destroyed the temple. Those zealots fled. You can turn the lights down low and put up the first picture. Those zealots fled to this mountain. Clay and I went up a path and climbed that thing and walked all over it. This is called Masada. In 34 BC, King Herod, who was always paranoid about a king replacing him and always paranoid about you know, armies coming to attack him, he made this, had them build this for him. It was a fortress. It had barracks for his soldiers. It had cisterns for his water. It had storehouses for his food. It had uh, defenses. And it only had one path going up. It was a skinny path, single file, and it was called the snake path. It went around the mountain like a snake, and we had to climb that thing to get up there. And this is called Masada. So Herod had built that. But when the Romans came in and crushed Jerusalem and tore down the temple, the zealots had to flee. And where did they flee? They fled out to Herod's fortress and they climbed that thing and they made their last stand. And the zealots were there. You can go another picture. There's from a different angle. There's a little bit closer view from the top. It's now open to tourists. You can go in there and see. And the things that were there at Jesus' time when the zealots came in, in 70 AD are still there today. You can look at them, see them, touch them, and you can overlook the Dead Sea. It's on the west bank of the Dead Sea. You can see a beautiful turquoise sea out there as you climb this thing and look around. And there they made their stand. Just hold that picture right there for a little while. And I want to tell you what happened. Well, they were up there and there's only one path to get there. And those 950 some odd zealots could defend that one path. You could just pick them off as they're walking up one little trail, right? With whatever you got, arrows and things. And they had defenses. So Rome surrounded it in weights. And their thinking is, we crushed everybody. We're not going to turn around and go home and leave these here. So they got a bunch of slaves. They made slaves go up there and they started building a big ramp up the one side of the mountain. And they waited like two years. And then in like 73 AD, they went up there to crush them. But let me read you his story, what happened, and we'll close and we'll pray for We'll pray for them. So when they got there, they found 953 zealots, men, women, and children, who had committed that only God would be their God and they would not serve Rome or fall to Rome. So they decided to make one last stand in rejection of Roman oppression and they committed suicide together up there. Accounts of the siege of Masada and the mass suicide were later reported by two women who had hid in a cistern with five children. They're the only ones that made it out. They recounted the final words of their leader, Eleazar, 
which Josephus then wrote down as a historian. And he wrote the guy's words who said this, Since we long ago, my generous friends, resolved never to be servants to the Romans, not to any other than to God himself, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind, the time is now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. And then he led them to suicide. I'm just making a point here. They had zeal for their God. In Old Covenant, it seemed rightly so. But when the fulfillment of the Old Covenant walked among them, they didn't recognize the truth. And they rejected the truth for their old way. So they still had a zeal and a passion, but their zeal and the passion was without knowledge. You see? Israel became a formal nation again in 1948. And nearly 1900 years after the fall of Masada, the fortress still figures significantly in Israel culture today. As part of defending their renewed country, all Israeli men and women are asked to serve in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. Every one of them. After high school, they served two or three years in the IDF. I forget which. Women and and men. Upon their completion of basic training, new IDF soldiers climb the snake path to Masada at night and are sworn in during a torch-lit ceremony at the top of Masada. All the Israel, even today, every year. Their final declaration of the night before descending the mountain as full-fledged soldiers. After they're sworn in, they're full-fledged soldiers. And their final decree, as they cry out in a chant, Masada shall never fall again. The Israeli Defense Forces have been protecting Israel, God has moved on their behalf, just like in the Old Testament, and they've won many wars since 1948. They play a major role in this end time scenario. I heard uh, from Robert this morning and Michael that they saw in the news where Zelensky said, hey, they, if they want to meet with Russian uh, for, to try to work something out, they want the Israeli people to go negotiate that because they trust them. Isn't that something? Israel has a role in this right here today too. Folks, I want to pray for Ukraine. And I just want to just present this idea to you that yes, I believe we should stand with Ukraine, that yes, I'm proud of all of those making a stand, and yes, if they came to our country, I would too, and yes, I believe all of Europe, but you know, um, the way it looks now, they've got Putin backed into a corner, and he seems a bit psychopathic. And now, now, He's saying he's got his nuclear people on high alert. What is that? Never in all these years has it been that close to some idiot pushing a button like that. We're hoping somebody in his close forces can maybe talk to him or whatever they need to do. You know? We want to pray for Ukraine And we want to pray for our nation, whatever might else happen. But I'll tell you this, what I want to do is stir up a zeal in you for the right cause. Our zeal is to stand for righteousness for our country and for every country. But the purpose that we're most zealous for is the cause of the kingdom, church. Amen? We want our passion and our zeal to be with the right purpose And that's to advance the kingdom of God, the only kingdom that's going to last forever. Are you with me? We always want to stand for truth and justice and righteousness in our neighborhood, in our school, in our government, and around the world. But don't lose your purpose, your main purpose of the zeal for your purpose, the cause of advancing the kingdom of God. I challenge you to do it today. Witnessing, talking, praying for folks. Amen?